I am Pastor Brian Shortley of Reformation Fellowship, Reformed Presbyterian Church. And I'm Pastor Stephen Pribble of Grace Orthodox Presbyterian Church. Welcome to Reformation Forum, the program relating the unchanging truth of Scripture to current issues. And tonight's subject is Christ alone. It's a very important subject. You know, many people think that all paths lead to God, that all if you're a sincere Hindu or a sincere Buddhist or Muslim or Jehovah's Witness or whatever, you're going to go to heaven. Tonight we're going to expose that as false according to the scriptures. You know, how have cultural forces put subtle pressure upon Christians to back off from the doctrine of Christ alone? How, how well has the church been resisting this pressure? Well, Brian, it's really good for us to think about this because actually uh, Christianity um, is an antithesis. It's antithetical to the thinking of the modern world. For that matter, it's antithetical to th the thinking of the world at any point throughout history. But uh, the people of God have always had to live in antithesis. Every generation has been forced to face the, f the seductive powers of syncretism. And syncretism means the tendency to try to synchronize and harmonize uh, the teachings of Scripture with the world around us, the, with the world around us. In other words, the prevailing philosophy of this world. And uh, anyway, it is seductive. And I have to say that, Brian, I really don't think that uh, the church is fighting this off very well. As a matter of fact, uh, the modern evangelical penchant is to try to build bridges to uh, secular thought or to groups within the church that hold to uh, false doctrines. And it doesn't work. We cannot build bridges to unbelief. What communion hath light with darkness? There's none. Uh, we cannot build uh, bri bridges. But there's always this, this tendency, uh, this, this penchant, if you will, uh, to, to urge the people of God just to water down the message a little bit so as to make it not quite so, uh, so repugnant, uh, so... Uh, unappealing uh, to the modern secular mindset. And you know, in many ways, we in the 20th century enjoy relative safety from violent attacks uh, by unbelievers against the church that were seen in earlier uh, centuries. And we have to wonder, now, why is this? Is, is this because uh, the people of the world have learned to be a little bit more polite and to tolerate um, religious viewpoints? Is, is there more religious toleration? or? Is it because we have so compromised the gospel that we no longer provoke the conflict that true faith engenders? <coughs> and I really believe that what's happened is the second, is th that the church has compromised. Um, R.C. Sproul wrote this. He said, polls taken by George Barna and George Gallup reveal an alar alarming intrusion of pagan ideas into the beliefs of modern Christians. A majority of professing evangelicals agree with the statement that human beings are basically good. This is indeed a clear repudiation of the biblical doctrine of human fallenness. Now, I've read those same statistics, and I'm appalled, I'm very alarmed, that the majority of professing evangelicals would actually agree with the statement that human beings are basically good. If that is true, then we don't need a savior. If that is true, then Christ's, Christ's coming to this earth was totally irrelevant. And if that is true, then there most definitely is not a need for Christ alone. Now that's the doctrine that we're going to be speaking about tonight. Christ alone. This is the historic doctrine of the Christian church, that apart from the Lord Jesus Christ, there is no salvation. There are going to be those that will be offended by what we're speaking about tonight. But you are offended not because of uh, Stephen Pribble and Brian Shortley and our ideas. You are offended because of what the Bible teaches. And you better consider why you are offended. And you better bring your thinking into conformity with Scripture because you're not going to bring Scripture into conformity with your thinking. Let God be true and every man a liar. And we want to be faithful to the living God. 
<coughs> and Brian, evangelical Christians do at least profess uh, on paper, or uh, sometimes they'll even tell you, I believe the Bible from cover to cover, but they, they profess that they want to believe the Bible above all else. Now, let's try to set, uh, settle this issue. Does the Bible teach salvation through Christ alone, or does it uh, teach that there is a possibility of salvation some other way? But the Bible is uh, absolutely crystal clear that salvation is only through Jesus Christ. I'm going to read a few passages and then comment. First of all, uh, John 3.18, He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And then John 3.36, He who believes in the Son has everlasting life, and he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Then John 10, 9. Jesus said, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved, and I will go in and out and find pasture. And earlier he said, anybody who doesn't enter by the door, who tries to enter in another way, Christ said, is a thief and a robber. Okay? Very, very clear. Jesus Christ also said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come unto the Father except by me. Very, very clear. And then Acts 4.12, it says here, for there is salvation in... There is, nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Crystal clear. The Bible teaches that there is no way to be saved except by believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. Only a sacrificial death, his sinless life imputed to those, the guilt of the, a person's sins who believes in Jesus Christ is imputed to Jesus Christ and paid for in full on the cross, and Christ's perfect sinless life is then imputed to those who believe in Christ and then on the day of judgment, they stand perfectly righteous because of Jesus Christ's perfect righteousness before God the Father. There is no other way. Now, I want to ask you this. If you believe that people can be saved, if you're a sincere Hindu, a sincere Buddhist, a sincere uh, Muslim, I want to ask you this. Then why did Jesus Christ have to die on the cross? If there's another way that a person can be saved apart from Jesus Christ, then why in the world would God send his son to suffer such torment and torture on the cross? That wouldn't make any sense at all. It's crystal clear. There is no other way. There's no other name under heaven by which man must be saved. If you're not a Christian, if you do not believe in Jesus Christ, if you're not trusting in Him alone for your salvation, if you think you can be saved by good works, if you think you can be saved by meditating, if you think you can be saved by following some sort of church dogma, if you think you can be saved by reading the Koran and praying and doing good works, if you think you can be saved by following Jehovah's Witness her heretical nonsense, you're going to go to hell. There's no other name under heaven. There is no other way than to believe in Jesus Christ, lay hold of his perfect righteousness by faith. There's no other way. Believe me, if there was, Christ wouldn't have to die. And it's not a popular doctrine. It's not a doctrine that people like. But if you don't believe that, I'm telling you, you're going to hell. There's no hope for you. There's no hope unless you trust in Jesus Christ alone for your salvation. Trust in him now. Give me a call. Give Pastor Pribble a call. Come and talk with us. Come and visit our church. You need to get in a good Bible-believing church that believes the Bible is the Word of God, infallible, inerrant, and trust in Christ alone. It's very important. You know, the church growth movement holds that in order to grow, a church must downplay divisive issues. And they downplay doctrine. They don't even think it's important. Uh, is declaring the doctrine of Christ alone a sure way to attain popularity in today's religious climate? Well, Brian, absolutely not. Uh, it's, it's all, it brings a smile to my face even to think about it that, uh, that you know, what we are speaking tonight is actually uh, f flying in the face of current popular wisdom. It really is. Uh, uh, recently, somebody started sending me uh, a copy of a conservative newspaper called The Christian News, which comes from a Missouri Synod Lutheran uh, background. And uh, anyway, there's an article on the issue that just arrived today as we're getting ready to tape called Jesus Christ, the Only Way to Heaven. And I don't think all Missouri Synods still believe that, but there are some that do. And this is a spunky little paper. I'm, I'm really enjoying uh, uh, reading through it. But uh, it, it notes, it says, we are living in a day of relativism and diluted biblical theology. That's what we have all around us. And the current conventional wisdom of the church growth movement is downplay doctrine. Doctrine is divisive. Denominationalism is divisive. Denominational distinctives are divisive. Downplay, you know, just take the rough edges off the Bible and it'll be a lot more palatable to people. 
And we do indeed live in a day of theological uh, relativism. But this paper observes, it says, those responsible for Princess Diana's funeral missed a great opportunity to present the saving gospel of Jesus Christ and man's only real hope in the hour for death to a worldwide audience of hundreds of millions. And that is true. That is certainly true. That here in the very uh, Westminster Abbey, the, the, the very uh, place that uh, was, was built in uh, uh, earlier years as a bastion of uh, Bible truth and where the Westminster Assembly met, the Assembly of Divines that was chosen by the uh, Parliament in England, now they have uh, the funeral for Princess Diana a woman who decidedly did not profess faith in Jesus Christ alone. Uh, she uh, was very uncomfortable, even with the very liberal Church of England. And she, uh, uh, she visited uh, soothsayers and uh, fortune tellers and clairvoyants, and, and she uh, left her, her children in order to cavort with uh, uh, her boyfriend and uh, admitted adultery. And now, her funeral is held at Westminster Abbey, and rather than <coughs> the religious leaders there taking this opportunity when some sources say 50 million people were uh, tuned into that funeral, and they could have unequivocally shared the truth of uh, the fact that there is only hope in the hour of death in Jesus Christ alone, they missed that opportunity, and instead they read Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, and that my friends, only relates to people whose shepherd is the Lord, Jehovah of the Bible. If he is not your shepherd, if your shepherd is not the Lord, if it's something else, then Psalm 23 with all its comfort is not for you. It's not for you. But you know, we don't worry about things like this because in 1 Kings chapter 19, we have the testimony of Elijah. He lifts up his heart in prayer to the Lord. He said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts because the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with a sword, and I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. If you stick by biblical doctrines, such as Christ alone, you may not be popular. But in the end, at the final judgment, it isn't popularity that's going to count. It's faithfulness to the truth of God's word. That's what's really going to count. <coughs> Brian, in the charismatic movement, and I know we've uh, discussed this before, you have some personal experience with this movement, but the charismatic movement has an emphasis upon personal experience instead of doctrine. Now, is the charismatic movement particularly susceptible to departing from the doctrine of Christ alone? And has this actually happened? Can you give some examples? Oh, it's a, it's a very, very uh, scary thing. The charismatic movement has such an emphasis on pers having a personal experience for example, on TV the other week on the McNeil News Lair Hour, a news hour, they showed this, uh, what they call the, uh, the revival down in uh, Pensacola, Florida, Pen Pensacola Revival. And it was basically uh, no doctrine, a bunch of people rolling on the floor, uh, barking like dogs, speaking in tongues, acting all crazy, and it was a bunch of nonsense. So experience has to be submitted to the Word of God, and this Romanism, you have to understand what the charismatic movement is doing. By ignoring doctrine and not focusing on doctrine, now some of the charismatics teach doctrine fairly well, but most charismatics, if you talk to them, like we did shows, uh, programs discussing the charismatic movement and the phone calls we got, nobody wanted to argue about scripture. Nobody wanted to debate doctrine. They all said, well, I had an experience, so I know it's true. <laughs> now what's happening is, is they're neglecting the great doctrines of the Bible, like justification by faith alone, and they're buddying up to Roman Catholics and Protestant liberals and so forth who have this experience of speaking in tongues, who have this supposed uh, second blessing, this second work of grace, as they call it, and what they're doing is they're neglecting doctrine. And this, they had a document back in 1994 called Evangelicals, Evangelicals and Catholics Together, and the whole basis of this stuff is basically let's water down the doctrine, let's ignore doctrine, and let's talk about our wonderful experience, and let's have a political cooperation against abortion and so forth. So the charismatic movement, okay, is uniting Roman Catholics who don't believe in the gospel at all, uh, modernists who completely reject the Bible as the word of God and the gospel, with evangelicals, who people claim to be evangelical, and it's basically a form of unbiblical ecumenicalism, 